you for having me. I'm kind of uh, happy I don't get to see my own x-rays now. Um, <laughs> All right, I'm here to talk about partial knee replacements. I think uh, Anoop uh, Jirani just talked about um, some uh, uh, indications for why using mobile bearing versus uh, non-mobile bearing unis. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, my disclosures relevant to this talk is that uh, I do work uh, and design and receive royalty for unicompartmental and, uh, and uh, robotic design. Um, we all know basic anatomy here. The reason I bring this up, and because this is a knee course, is that we are subject to um, the sophistication of the models we use whenever we, whenever we do the surgeries that we do. And so our theoretical models, the models that are in our head, guide how we do what we do things. And I put these pictures up here because the bottom picture is a perfect example of oversimplification of a knee. Because we know very clearly that you're not balancing a knee based on a lateral LCL and a medial MCL, and that's it. Even though we're taught that day in, day out, every single training program that you do. And when we talk about joint replacement, we often talk about that. It's probably more accurate to talk about a lateral complex. And any of the sports doctors here, which there are a lot in the audience, understand that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of articles describing the importance of the various structures. So I'm just bringing up the point that you should question the model that you're using to do the procedures that you're doing to make you better at what the surgery is that you're doing. So this is, um, this is a, a, a kind of a change or a modification of that same picture. And I put all of these blue parts here to talk about all the various different uh, ligaments that are actually in the knee. Um, and you can see on the lateral side, just like there's significant rollback, there's a significant number of different structures that contribute to stability. So the basic concepts here are absolutely critical so that we can all talk about the same things when we're talking about things. And so for the indications for unicompartmental knee, there are some hard indications and there's some relative contraindications. The, hard, the harder indications are, are we don't want an inflammatory arthritis. Now in the era of biologic medications, that is now starting to be questioned as well. So we are seeing more and more partial knee replacements done in the face of rheumatoid arthritis in a well-controlled, in remission rheumatoid patient on biologics. But infection is definitely not, you don't want to do an infection, multiple compartment, compartment problems, uncorrectable deformity. Uh, those are the things that we usually say are probably not the best indications for a partial knee replacement. Relative contraindications would be an absent ACL, poor bone quality, or obesity. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But I say relative contraindications because it depends on the style of unicompartmental knee that you're doing. But understanding how each articulation in the knee that is different and understanding how they're distinct really helps you in doing a partial knee replacement and your criteria for such. So I put this picture up, but I'm going to go into this in detail because basically the knee is three different joints that are all connected. And so the medial compartment, when we talk about the medial compartment, is really a more traditional arthritic picture. That is, chondromalacia is the important part of the medial side. The meniscus is less important. The meniscus is actually more, more accurately called a labrum. It's actually a labrum, not so much a meniscus, because it doesn't move with the joint. It's just an extension of the joint itself. Um, and there's very little AP translation, as you saw in this picture right here, the medial side being on the far, far uh, right. Uh, there's not as much translation. And so it's really important to understand this. It also takes more of the load of the leg. And there's a lot of um, osteotomy and deformity doctors here that understand this quite well. But that range is quite significant, but it is almost always biased towards the medial side, except in valgus deformity. Now, the patellofemoral joint is very different, and there's quite a, we had a whole series of talks a couple days ago about the patellofemoral joint. Suffice it to say, it's important to understand that even in the face of significant arthritis and significant chondromalacia of the patella, you can still have no symptoms. The symptoms in the patellofemoral joint come from an error in pressure and an error in tracking. And John Fulkerson and the entire patellofemoral society would be absolutely happy to hear me say that. Because that's what we're doing. This is not a resurfacing circumstance because we see time and time again people with horrible bone-on-bone -bone arthritis of their kneecap that is no, they have no problems. And so it's important to understand this. And, you know, the European experience for not resurfacing patellas on total joint replacement for years also shows us the same thing. It is just consistent with our history. Now, on the lateral compartment, um, I, I would offer that the meniscus accepts more of the load than the rest of the rest of the joint. It is no longer a cartilage issue, but is actually a meniscal integrity issue. And I've commented on that up on the podium a couple times this week. 
the meniscus on the, on the lateral side makes up almost 80% of the surface area of the entire joint, both on the, sup, on, the, on the superior and inferior side of the meniscus. And that entire meniscus moves, and that allows the two convex surfaces to not point load and cause pressure. This is why we also understand that removing the lateral meniscus becomes a pre-arthritic condition. And we see time and time again how that progresses to arthritis fairly quickly. And this is, a, another, this is another modification of that picture that I showed you before. I am listing the structures on the, on, on, on the sides, but I also have these, these hoops drawn. And these hoops that I've drawn right over here are the, 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 the anterior posterior articulation or um, anchor points of the meniscus, the roots, and how the meniscus migrates back and forth to create that translation that we talk about. So now this is the model that I use whenever I start thinking about partial knee replacements. And I do partial knee replacements in all three compartments. So we're primarily talking about medial compartment partial knee replacements here. So I'm gonna to stick to that mostly in, in this talk. Uh, but, but for medial compartment partial knee replacements, my indications are all those that I said, plus they must have an intact lateral meniscus and no patellofemoral joint symptoms. That way I know that the patellofemoral joints pressure and tracking are not symptomatic. That way I know that the lateral compartment is no longer in a pre-arthritic state. And this is why I don't often change my indications during surgery. I really commit to a partial knee replacement initially. So why would you even do partial knee replacements? Well, we know that, the, that they have better clinical results in the short term and patient satisfaction is higher. Uh, we know that they have better functional scores than total knee replacements. And they have higher survivorship in, in centers that do a lot of them. We know that, okay? However, there's other problems. We know that they have significant survivorship issues when you're looking at registry data and when you're including other patient experiences and other surgeon experiences. We also know that historic data is not very compelling, okay? The more recent data is a little bit better, but historic data is not that compelling. So what impacts the results of a partial knee replacement, and again, I'm talking mostly medial compartment unis because it's harder to talk about the other ones, is all of these different things here. Probably in these big centers that are doing a lot of surgeries, I would offer that patient selection is actually probably the single most important one. And that is a bit of a fuzzy science. It's not exactly hard, hard set, even though there is a Nuffield classification that we all use. And then there is a historic uh, Scott Cozen uh, criteria that we use. Uh, even both of those have been modifiable over the course of time. The one thing that we do have the ability to adjust quite well is accuracy of implant, implant, implantation. And the reason we have the ability to do that is because we have, uh, we have uh, more recent higher technologies that we can use to make that more reliable. So, Basically, I use robots for my partial knees. I am at this point in my career can do a very good partial knee replacement manually, but I refuse to do so. Why? Well, it's easy to get good results with, with, with robots and it's not exactly a, a very difficult surgery, but it's difficult to get exact. It's difficult to get consistent results and oftentimes your radiographs can look a little off. And with the robot, your radiographs don't look that off. Um, it's also something that's not easily replicatable in lower volume surgeons. So if you can take at least one of those problems off of the list, putting a reliable, radiographically accurate and reproducible partial knee replacement is at least one thing that you can control even as a lower volume surgeon. So what I'm getting at here is that unis are easy to do, but they're difficult to do really well. And um, everybody always scrutinizes x-ray results with, uh, with everything that we do. And partial knee replacements classically show sloppier or more variable x-ray results. Um, also, there are relative contraindications like the high BMI, portibial bone, ACL deficiency, and bicompartmental wear that can actually be solved with what's known as a third generation um, tibial sparing uni. Now, admittedly, I've had multiple arguments with, uh, with the Australians in the room because, you know, they like to they hold me to the ringer. But the reality is, is that we still have data that we are showing only midterm data now. We do not have long-term data to support that. But we are very optimistic about what this looks like. Um, and then there's the concern, and this has been brought up um, several times by, by our... Um, by our alignment colleagues here, that the conversion of a partial knee replacement to a total knee replacement uh, is an inferior surgery. And I would offer that that is absolutely true with, uh, with prior generation implants. And currently, we are able to do partial knee replacement to total knee replacement conversions uh, with only primary implants and without having to deal with uh, revision in instruments. 
So the most compelling reason that I'm talking about this is what we call the third generation tibial sparing uni. What we know now is that if the partial knee replacement is going to fail, historically that has always failed with respect to tibial subsidence, tibial fracture, and tibial loosening. They are tibial problems. Now, aside from some select designs that had some femoral failures, those are poorly designed implants and those are not what we're talking about. We are specifically talking about the large body of partial knee replacements. And so the tibial, the tibial sparing uni looks like this. So on the left-hand side of the screen, right over here, this is, an, this is one that was done with the third generation tubule spring design. This is, this is very clearly, I used this one because I left the osteophyte here. And you can see the osteophyte is right here. You can see how very little tibia was actually removed. I did this yesterday in my live surgery for those of you who are watching. Now, what I will offer here though, is that this is non-anatomic. The joint line has been raised here. So if you look at where that is, that joint line is almost at zero neutral. And that's not exactly where the joint line should be. The joint line should be at about a three degree, three degree slant. So this requires that you downsize the femoral implant and you, and you proximalize it a little bit in order to keep that point of isometry with the rest of those ligamentous structures that I'm just showing you in the earlier slides. Um, this is an extreme case, but this is a well-done Oxford Uni. And this is what we call a second-generation Uni. The second-generation Uni is the Oxford Uni. The reason it's called second-generation is because the Oxford Unicompartmental Knee was the first Uni that was actually focused on ligament isometry. So the, the Oxford Uni is specifically a non-anatomic Uni. It is the, the, fe, the femur is a perfect sphere and it has a mobile bearing. That's not how the medial side works, but it's a tibial first preparation as you just, you just saw um, Sachin do just now, a very wonderful job of that. And it's, uh, it's, it's tibia first, and then you continue to ream the femur in order to find the proper gaps. That's what makes it a second generation uni, and that is also what makes it probably the single most successful unicompartmental knee in modern history. However, there were other implant designs before that. Those other implant designs were based on matching anatomy. And that was where you prepared the femur, then you prepared the tibia, you put them back in, and then you hoped for the best. And that's why, historically speaking, the first gen generation unis did really well in certain hands, but there was a lot of variability. And so that variability got, got significantly dropped with the second generation unis. However, if you look at this, this joint line has been fairly well reconstructed compared to where it is. You know, if that's the joint line here, then you're looking, then you're looking at a, a very, very reasonable joint line. And you can see how aggressive that has been on the tibia itself. And it's easy to see how if you don't get onto that in, in, incredible peripheral subchondral plate, that you can decrease the strength of the support of your implant. Now, I chose this particular x-ray for a reason, because while it's a well-done uni, it is a more extreme version of what you see. So... So that's probably my single most compelling reason to use robotics for this. This is also my most compelling reason to use par um, uh, uh, fixed bearing partials with this is because you can, you can do a reconstruction that actually has an anatomic uh, design to it and place it non-anatomically and be able to do that theoretically before you do it. So the robot allows you to figure out where your point of isometry is before you even start bone prep. And so that's, that's really why I'm doing it that way. Um, another thing that we can talk about here is the fact that you can look at the knee as a, as a multi-compartment um, surgery. So you have, and we've seen multiple versions of that during the course of this course, of this course where you have all of the cartilage stuff that can be done in earlier stages of problems. You can do partial knee replacements for your mid-stage problems, and that can be done in all three compartments. And then you have the total knee and late-stage uh, arthritis. One of the other things that uh, robotics has allowed us to do, however, is that we are not seeing early or midterm failures of the partial knee replacements that we're implanting, it does open up the, the Pandora's box of now wondering, do we start treating contralateral wear or progression or new injury with another partial knee replacement? That's something that we've not done historically, but now that we have robotics, we can. So is that the right answer or not? I don't have the answer for you to that. I don't think anybody does, but it is something that is starting to become more popular right now. So uh, that's all of my talk for the, for the partial knee replacements. I want to say um, thank you very much for having me, and um, uh, we'll move on to the next live surgery if it's ready, I believe.